Well, hey out there, friends, fans, feds, and frenemies. It's me, Postmodern Cowboy, and I'm actually back with a cowboy commentary video. Uh, it's been a very long time, about a year, in fact, I think, since I did my last cowboy commentary. But I, I am back, still shooting from the hip, um, and today we're talking about Ukraine again. We're talking about Ukraine again. Um, there was an event today in Toronto, which I attended. And it was weird. Um, it was a tanky event. For those of you who aren't aware, tankies are a kind of left-wing ideologue, um, a generally authoritarian communist or a reactionary supporter of authoritarian communist states. Um, obviously, there aren't many authoritarian communist states left in the world, truly. Um, you know, the Soviet Union is long since gone, so tankies who were once the flag-waving supporters of the Soviet Union um, have defaulted to becoming the flag-waving supporters of, like, the Russian Federation um, and the People's Republic of China um, and Syria and Venezuela and Iran and, like, none of these are really communist. Like, China, okay, arguably is still a communist nation, um, but it is socialism with Chinese characteristics. It is a quasi-communist capitalist state, um, almost indistinguishable from America, except um, with respect to its uh, history of imperialist aggression. China hasn't yet reached the status of a great empire um, or begun flexing its muscles, but it's certainly building toward that point. Um, and now this isn't a talk about China. Um, this isn't a talk about tankies. Um, I just wanted to clear the air um, about what a tanky is, because I'm just going to use that word. I'm going to use that word to describe these folks. This event was entitled The War in Ukraine and How to Stop It. Okay, yeah. You know, there's a bunch of leftists want to get together and talk about stopping the war in Ukraine. Like, I'm there for it. Guys, let's stop the damn war. Um, but, of course, that's not really what they meant, is it? <laughs> um, the subheader is the historical and political origins of the U.S. NATO war against Russia. The U.S. NATO war against Russia. Like that's factually incorrect. That is that is a lie. You serve the lie. And of course, behind the event is uh, which which was held uh, by the way. I should say this this event was held at the Lillian H. Smith branch of the Toronto Public Library um, in an underground auditorium built something like a bunker, very weird room um, to have this kind of event in. Uh, strange access. There is an elevator, but uh, everybody came down this sort of like austere spiral staircase with um, like torch, mock torches. I think it's supposed to be like fantasy themed for the kids so they can have like, um, you know, their, their fantasy castle dungeon. Um, but it really did feel like being in a, a bomb shelter, um, listening to um, some bizarre, and these are Trotskyites, the group that organized this, some bizarre trot. Um, if you don't know what a trot is, just Google Leon Trotsky, who, um, you know, didn't have the effect he wanted to have on history. Um, and Trotskyites are always trying to compensate. That's all I'm going to say. He was like a contemporary of of uh, Stalin and Lenin, um, wound up being assassinated in, uh, I think, Mexico. Um, I'm not I'm not too uh, sure on my Trotsky history. I do know that in the context of um, Ukraine, Trotsky was a famous enemy of the Ukrainian anarchists, um, Nestor Makhno and others um, who implemented uh, much of Lenin's vision in Ukraine or helped to implement much of uh, Lenin's vision in Ukraine uh, vis-a-vis its Sovietization and its uh, induction to communism. Anyway, this I'm getting way ahead of myself here. Trotsky, check him out. Um, kind of a loser in history. But uh, yeah, so it was Sunday, June 4th. That, that is today. Um, 2.30 to 4 p.m. It, uh, it it got cut short, folks. Spoiler <laughs> alert, it ended at about 3.30 and at 3.10, 3.15, I don't know. Um, the featured speaker was Keith Jones. Uh, now, Keith Jones is the national socialist. No, no, sir, not national socialist. He's the national secretary of the Socialist Equality Party. I've, I've never heard of the Socialist Equality Party. They are, they are fucking irrelevant, guys. They are a tiny, tiny breakaway group of the breakaway group of the breakaway group. Like, we're talking a shell of an organization with, like, a nominal membership. And zero political power, zero political relevance, um, boomers. Um, but that's okay because they position themselves as the international youth and students for social equality. 
So it's the Secretary of the Socialist Equality Party, but they call themselves the International Youth and Students for Social Equality. I saw like three youth in the room, the two of whom were there to oppose the event. Um, and there were, I'm going to get into this, there were Ukrainians who showed up to oppose this event. Um, in a way that I haven't seen happen yet in this. And this is why I'm doing a video because I'm pretty excited about the portents here. I think that there's a couple of teachable moments. Um, and I, I regret to inform you, I don't have much video to bring. Um, and we're going to touch on that as well and why that happened. Um, now, Keith Jones is also a member of the International Editorial Board of the World Socialist website, WSWS.org. Um, mean mainline kind of tanky publication um they are uh fast fast replacing the gray zone um which is uh suitably shamed and disrupted um they're fast replacing the gray zone in the uh political conscience uh conscious yeah political political uh psychology of the the far left and i'm gonna i have to I have to put that in scare quotes because like far left I'm far left, guys. Like, uh, when I see these folks, I don't really recognize them as part of the left. It's like quasi-fascistic, weird, um, you know. My read on these events is pretty simple. Um, and the orientation organization, like the World Socialist website, I don't believe they're really leftists at all. I think that they exist entirely as a psychological operation to defame the left, to systematically defame left-wing ideas by linking them to unpopular or contentious positions um, or controversial actions, endorsing controversial actions in the name of international labor um, in a way that actually helps the capitalist oligarchs. Um, and I think I think I'm hitting on uh, political theory around that. I haven't heard many people suggest this, but there are a lot of people on the left who, uh, and I'm starting to call them the cartoon left, exist as a weird cartoon, as as a a caricature of what a left wing opinion ought to look like, um, and they do it in order to like focus them their perspective is a lightning rod for controversy in a way that either forces the left to back them um, or makes the left look guilty by association. And on the right, on the far right, there are people who are likewise asserting that the left is bad on issues like Ukraine, that the left, that the, that the labor wants Ukraine to fail and supports Russia and sort of like promotes this idea of us as traitors. I see it in the National Post coming from uh, columnists like uh, Joe Roberts, who had an article um and he positions himself as a leftist too which is bizarre um and for people like uh, adam zivo uh, zivo Ginovich, uh who is um a canadian journalist he was actually shelled in ukraine uh, today he's over there as a war correspondent which like i was just tweeting why do i have to live in the timeline where that guy gets to go you know he was anti antifa um just just a just a repugnant person he's over there he's like posting writing anti trans gendered screeds in Ukraine about social issues back here in Canada, including, interestingly enough, events at public libraries. Um, and he's, you know, also at the front line in Ukraine being shelled today because he's there reporting as a war reporter. Now we're talking about the event today. So the event was at the public library and, okay, so there's two things at the library. Like four or five years ago, the library hosted a memorial for um, Barbara Kozlowska. Um, I'm butchering her last name. And I don't really care because she's a fucking Nazi. Um, and like an actual Nazi uh, who was provided legal representation to, um, what was his, uh, what was his name? Ernst Zundel um, through his, uh, he's a prominent Canadian neo-Nazi from the like late 80s, early 90s. Um, and when Zundel uh, was going through court with his organization, the Heritage Front, um, Barbara Kozlowska uh, basically provided significant amounts of legal support because she believed in his cause um, and she she supported him ideologically. So when she when she when she kicked the bucket, a bunch of Nazis uh, had a memorial at the library here in Toronto. Um, the Toronto Library let that go ahead, and that was pretty controversial. I remember that being pretty controversial. We're like, oh, no, no, guys, free speech, free speech. We like, we like welcome all opinions here. Okay, cool. Um, so you might have seen more recently the library, and not just in not just in Toronto or in Canada, but but uh, across the Western Hemisphere, specifically in uh, North America, Canada, the United States, um, 
libraries have been turned into culture war battlegrounds uh, on the uh, trans inclusion issue, which is interesting that you get this guy, this journalist over there, uh, Zivo, um, who's writing stuff about this issue um, while interfacing with Ukraine uh, stuff. I think, I think personally that there is a disinformation vector um, inside of the uh, drag issue space. Um, it's a fracture point that drives social discord um, and leads us towards um, and I like, don't get me wrong, I support um, the right of drag artists to perform. I support the right of drag artists to perform in public spaces. I support the right of community groups to use the public library. Uh, I think libraries are really, really important. And uh, I'm trans, uh, pro, pro trans in the extreme, pro trans in the extreme. And my track record as an activist, my Google track record as an activist, um, bears that out. Let's. Uh, Let's reflect for a moment that there's this incredibly divisive dynamic um, occurring at public libraries, and we see far right groups turning up to oppose um, left wing organized uh, or even liberal organized drag events. And now, I don't know who's organizing all of the drag events across North America, but I will say that there's uh, some precedent to say that like in 2016, 2017, we saw the Internet Research Agency, a Russian online disinformation outfit with ties to the Kremlin, operating um, protest events. So they were calling demonstrations in the United States, um, either fascist or anti-fascist demonstrations, uh, pro-Trump or anti-Trump. Um, BLM, indigenous demonstrations, all sorts of stuff. I mean, they were doing it to foster division and they were simultaneously all, like also running the counter demonstrations. You had rallies, and we've seen this in Canada recently, um, the rally of the Canadian Tire, where nobody knew who organized the event. Um, nobody knew who, who initially was the source of the online flyer that circulated inviting people out to the event. Um, and lo and behold, suddenly like hashtag boycott Canadian Tire is trending. And it's like, Okay, um, and actually it was a Nazi connected to Barbara Koslowska who showed up to that um, that caused the event to become controversial in the first place. And like Nazis have been showing up to the drag events as well. We've seen um, in the US, I think there were five um, far right groups uh, attended drag events in one day. Um, don't have the date of that offhand, but uh, I know Patriot Front was one of them. Um, the Sons of Confederate Veterans uh, was one of them. Um, in Canada, we actually had White Lives Matter show up at the same time, the same day. And I think it was like a blood and honor uh, chapter um, as well at, at a rally in the U.S. I don't remember the fifth group. But we saw, we saw a cohesive effort. Very weird that we had all of these Nazi groups stage a simultaneous day of action. Um, in response. I'm not saying that the drag events are bogus. Like, again, don't get me wrong here. This isn't like a crackpot conspiracy theory, but I am saying that there seems to be some kind of vector for destabilization and pushing um, a divisive social agenda. And I just have this hunch that some of the events that are being called are also being, um, you know, the, the counter demos are being organized uh, through the same networks. That's what I'll say. And you can see some of this stuff play out in like, the red brown alliance on on social media which I, which I guess i guess this is what we're we're getting into um red being a uh, communist far left like trotskyite stalinist leninist um and brown being fascist there is you know more than just the molotov uh ribbentrop pact uh, underscoring that history there there's um you know a long and storied relationship between uh, communism and fascism um, and I, and again, I'm, I'm, this is not small C communism we're talking about. This is like big C monolithic communism. Um, that is itself kind of a caricature of real left-wing ideas, socialist ideas. Like I think, I think many of the socialist greats in history would frankly like to punch some of the, some of the people who claim to be communists, um, like Caleb Maupin, um, this, uh, the, with the, uh, the CPI we'll like to punch him in the nose. Um, that's that's what I'll say. Give him give him the old Richard Spencer. Which some, sometimes sometimes you gotta do sometimes you gotta do that. Um, today was not that day. Uh, there was no violence today. I'll say that. Um, there was certainly the threat of state violence, um, which blew my mind. The talk. Why don't you listen to the talk? All right. Yeah, listen to the talk and don't disrupt. That's the problem. All right. You want to hear what they have to say? Of course. And agree to follow the rules of conduct of the meeting, we don't you will be allowed to participate. Please go ahead. We're here. Okay, so this, 
The communists here in Toronto called the police to the library. Um, and when I got to the library, there were three security guards who'd been hired by the library um, for the day. And then the library seemed to have activated their drag defense protocols, but this time to protect a pro-Russia speaking event. Um, and that's worth noting that there's now also an interface with that issue um, and the creation, the slow creation. I have been predicting this stuff on Twitter for a little while. Um, the slow creation of new precedents. Um, we got a politician here who wants to create uh, what do they call community safety zones around public libraries, which would explicitly prohibit types of protest targeting the LGBT community right now. Um, but I have a strong suspicion, um, especially if the Nazis showed up, that it's going to be extended to include um, ethnic minority communities. So a pro-Russia event being counter-protested would be you know, treated the same way the library might hypothetically treat uh, treat a pro-Israel event um, being kind of protested by Palestinians. And the precedents aren't good there. I think it's a sinister piece of legislation. It turns the police into the arbiters. It, it sets $25,000 protest fines. Um, and again, like, my solution is pretty simple. If you've got bigots showing up to protest your drag event, you bop them in the nose. Okay? I said it. I'm saying it there. Um, YouTube might have an issue with that. I don't. I don't know if that um, violates the terms of service. I, uh, you know, um, I could be also counsel to commit. Um, so let's let's hedge our bets here and say that um, anti-fascists taking a kinetic action against fascists, anti-fascists taking direct action against far-right groups have far better track record of success than relying on the state to solve our problems for us. Um, and this this local councillor here um, wants the state to become the... She also wants to give this power to a conservative government. Like, we have a conservative government here and she's ostensibly a socialist, but not really. Um, she, you know, has, it was noted for her time as city council for anti-homeless policies. So like we turn around and we give a conservative government, which we have in this province, new powers to control protest and dissent, requiring LGBT events to register with an anti-LGBT attorney general who will then ostensibly protect those events by sending armed police to protect them. Like that's... That's screwed up, guys. Like, I, I mean, it, it is, and it's not really getting the coverage that it deserves. Um, I think a lot of people here are fixated on like a mayoral race. That's like we actually have a chance to get a socialist elected. She's leading in the polls. Um, so there's a lot of strange things going on in Canadian politics right now. And I haven't, I haven't talked about the mayoral thing at all. But maybe, uh, maybe I will do a commentary video on the mayoral thing because I think it interfaces really nicely um, with this issue. Okay, so to the event, to what happened. Um, Keith Jones got up and the Ukrainians started to shut him down. And immediately, Keith has the police come in um, and remove a woman. Um, you got to put someone against the wall. This is like, we, we know how trots work. We know how Othcoms work. Um, a woman who, whose interjection was innocuous. I think, I think ultimately her offense was that she had filmed. Um, and again, we're going to talk about that just in one hot second. Um, and she was ejected from the room with the support of a very, very smug looking library staffer who seemed super confident, super in her element, like she was doing the cool woke thing of helping the communists kick out the bad fascist Ukrainians. And it was it was like sickening. It was a gross display. I have seen some pretty gross displays from public servants, but that that moment sticks out in my mind as like, and then she gets up and she, she gives a speech about what will and will not be allowed in the library. And she says they won't allow any um, discrimination based on uh, ethnic origin. She says ethnic origin, which is an interesting mix of two concepts being ethnicity and national origin, um, those being two separate things, but she says ethnic origin. Um, and immediately the speaker turns around within two minutes, they've said the words Ukrainian Nazis like three times. Um, that's vilification. That is actually discrimination on the basis of ethnic origin. We saw the exact same tactics come into groups like Pegida and Patriots uh, against the Islamization of the West in uh, what, 2017, 2018 in Toronto. Pegida was holding uh, weekly rallies. They were doing the same. They were a German group, um, and they were connected to the pro-Russia disinfo space too. So it is fascinating to me that we see the same tactics evolving. It's even another organization, WSWS. 
with an acronym for a name that's uh, pushing vilification. Um, back then, it was Syrian terrorist. Now, I have a hard time believing that the Toronto Public Library would sign off on hosting an event um, themed around uh, raising uh, awareness of um, you know Syrian terrorists. Like that would be considered to be bigotry that would be <laughs> vilification um that's hate speech we recognize that i think as leftists and, and most politicians would agree but for some reason when it comes to typecasting all ukrainians as nazis um the same distinction is not is not made and they definitely did um sweep uh, sweep with those generalizations um it was it was pretty egregious um uh, and i would say that that library staffer um deserves to lose her damn job for that. I appreciate that the public service is an important thing, and I also know that it's kind of a cushy gig, and she might have union protection, um, but she allowed hate speech to proceed uh, after explicitly cautioning um, everybody in the room to not engage in that. And she also told us not to film. Now, I had at that point already filmed, and you've seen that clip already, which includes the library staffer. It's like, what, 20 seconds long, I thought I was going to get more chance to uh, film, especially some of the more controversial statements made. Um, but the library has a prohibition against filming, and this is this is a legal gray area for me. So the justification offered on site is that the library gives prior written permission to people who wish to film for commercial purposes. Um, this would be like if you wanted to film a commercial in a library, if you wanted to film um, a political ad or an event in a library, um, you would need permission to film, you'd pay a fee. Um, and even for non-commercial purposes, if you wanted to film like a funny video of you and your friends reading books you love for your YouTube channel, they'd want like a hundred bucks and some sign off to, you know, make sure it wasn't um, something that they're going to hear about later. Now, here's where it gets dicey. This is a public building. This is a public building, you know, there's literally, literally a homeless guy sleeping on the second floor. Um, and I'm fine with that, but like, it's a public access building. Anybody can go in there. It's a library and you get a library card. You can walk out of there with books too. So um, you have a public building and let's say a member of the media, a journalist, um, I'm not going to say that I'm a journalist right now because um, the Canadian government certainly wouldn't recognize me as one. I'm not a working journalist. I don't earn a percentage of my income through the sale of uh, stories uh, that, or information that I gather. But let's say that a working journalist decided to attend this event today um, and take photos of the event. Now, is the library going to prohibit a journalist, an accredited journalist for like the Toronto Star, the Globe and Mail? Are they going to prevent an accredited journalist from filming an event, a public access event? The answer is no, and the answer is that's an, an egregious abrogation of press freedom rights. Um, if there's an event being held in a public building, the media has a right to access that event, and with limited exception, you should be able to record that event or, or monitor that event however they choose, because that's what a, a free media is all about. Um, and myself there today as an activist looking to gather information on this organization, on people who might be attending, I felt uh, directly impaired. Uh, and it's very clear that the library's policy is shielding these people deliberately. Um, and the justification I've been given is that the library decided to create some very, uh, very questionable filming policies because people were entering the library to film children attending drag events so again we're coming back to this like weird precedent setting of public space as explicitly hostile to information gathering while speech is just being platformed uncritically well performance and speech are being platformed uncritically and again like i support drag performance i think that the library has a responsibility to evaluate events against each other if if you're having a nazi memorial if you're having a drag event, if you're having a Trotskyite book club's anti-Ukrainian talk, which is being picketed by dozens of Ukrainians, you're having these events, the reality is that you need to weight them differently. There needs to be um, a non-sociopathic policy. There needs to be a human brain that's empathic and capable of evaluating the strengths and weaknesses of the different events, um, their merits and their faults. and providing security or access to platforms or access to the public um, and, and media and the activists differently for the different events. Because what I saw today 
who was the library, protect anti-Ukrainian vilification and hate speech with the same energy that they protected a drag event. And I think, um, uh, you know, a questionable actor like Adam Zivo, uh, who I mentioned earlier, who's over in Ukraine right now, writing far-right screeds about how the left is bad on Ukraine, well, producing anti-transgendered and anti-drag uh, speeches, he advocates for the LGB uh, designation, lesbian, gay, bisexual, T is left out, um, you know, trans-exclusionary, um, it's a, it's a trans-exclusionary approach. Um, anyway, he, so he's advocating for that over there right now. He's going to have a field day with with this comparison um, if he chooses or if his uh, his handlers at the National Post put him up to it. Um, and again, they're owned by what? Chatham Asset Management, the people who apparently hold the secrets uh, the, the Donald Trump, like, I don't know if it's the P tape or what, but they apparently hold the secrets of, of Trump's um, legal settlements with uh, women who've come after him. So that's interesting. Um, and they're, they're major players in Canadian media. It, like, it just, it just blows my mind that people don't talk about this stuff or know this stuff more. Anyway, so the event proceeded, um, and there were um, numerous, numerous um, uh, small and large eruptions by um, pro-Ukrainian demonstrators, um, some of whom came festooned with flags or flowers, um, who raised their voices in dissent, um, and were universally shouted down by the, uh, I'd say, 15 to 20 attendees who were very loud and very boisterous. Like, the 15 to 20 people who wanted to be there in that room were like, they were nasty, man. Um, I looked some of those people in their eyes and I, I saw malice. I saw absolute contempt and really like the only times I've seen that um, I'm reminded of back in 2016 when the Jewish Defense League, um, a far right Kahanist organization hosted Pegida, the Patriots Against the Islamization of the West at uh, events at the Toronto Zionist Center up on Marley Avenue here. Um, I'm reminded of that, except this was in a fucking public library. Right, like it's the same level of hatred and vitriol that I saw then, I saw now. Um, the speakers, you know, to their credit, Trotskyites are, are weird, and I think we miss the opportunity to unpack what is said because nobody understands their niche ideology. You really have to be like a, a consumer of niche left wing ideas in order to understand why Trotskyites would accuse Vladimir Putin of adventurism um which is like a cardinal sin in their <laughs> in their socialist interpretation and their um you know their their positioning of the international working class is something that should fight against both zelensky and putin you know like has some points on which ukrainian socialists might even agree um but totally missed the point and and deliberately missed the point in a way that um, lays out, uh, lays down rather, lays down covering fire for the Russian invasion by muddying the waters uh, around what's being discussed. You know, even claiming that it's a war uh, waged by the United States and NATO against Russia. Like, nobody made Russia invade, guys. Like, and whether or not Canada was training Nazis in Ukraine, like, these, and these are things that up until um, 2020 or 2021, like, even I, believed because it was in our media it was in the propaganda we were consuming and there were no dissenting opinions unpacking that um i had always been pretty critical of like nazis at maidan um i firmly believed in the cause of maidan um it, ending a system of corruption um and ousting a pro oligarch government um you know again the speaker today couldn't even pronounce Yanukovych, like couldn't even pronounce, also mentioned Francis Fukama, and I, it like blew my mind that this guy was on stage speaking to us, but didn't even like know who he was speaking about, and it wasn't, um, it wasn't any kind of impairment, he really like, anyway, um, the ouster of Yanukovych was great, uh, it was, it was a, it provided inspiration for me as a leftist being like, yeah, people can stick it to their leaders. Yeah, that's great. Um, and you know, I saw people in the nonprofit sector in Ukraine out protesting in Maidan, and I knew that there were anarchists and socialists out there protesting too, and union members, um, which I am now, which is cool. Um, uh, but I, 
I really believed in that. And now, you know, seeing leftists who've continued to absorb the propaganda, um, who've continued to buy into Ukraine as a Nazi state, um, we're arming Nazis in the Ukraine, um, whatever it is they're saying, like, we need to have a serious conversation as uh, leftists. We need to have a serious conversation as socialists about what's being done in our name, what's being said in our name, because that what stuff that I heard today wasn't wasn't remotely socialist. It had the trappings of socialism. Oh yeah, the working class, but Russia should be able to do whatever it wants. And the questions and queries coming from the Ukrainians were sound. Um, I feel like there was a bit of a political disconnect with you know the Ukrainians who were there were normies who were activated through uh, mainstream liberal uh, or even conservative. Ukrainian community organizations. They were not there to engage in the intricate internal discourse of left wing politics. Um, and if there's anyone out there who wants to engage in the internal, uh, the, the intricate internal discourse of left wing politics, like I'm happy to do that. That's, that's a role that I can fill. Um, but they, you know, they, they didn't really understand the nuances, um, but they did have some cogent, some cogent responses. Um, you know, one young man stands up and says, well, how, how do you propose that we fight back? Uh, and the speaker really couldn't answer that. He just beat around the bush and prevaricated for five minutes. And like, it, it was just, it was just really bad. It was just really bad. You know, they the, the opened, the, there was an introduction, introduction by someone, um, a journalist, let's put that in square, scare quotes too, um, but a journalist from the World Socialist website. And he compared the, a North Atlantic Fellows Organization, which is an online counter disinformation um, group. What do they call them? The, the sketchy, disorganized, brain damaged cartoon dogs of NAFO. Um, he compared them to the Proud Boys. And like I tweeted this, but I wanted to stand up and shout it. And I would have been ejected had I done so because they were, they were ejecting people. Um, bitch, I've punched more Proud Boys than you have ever seen and i'm here today to call you a fascist like that's where i was at that's where my head was at because it's an absurd comparison there are some problematic characters in nafo um, it is a large it's very much like antifa uh, unlike the proud boys which have a formal organizational structure and a hierarchy and nafo is amorphous it's anonymous it's funny um and tends to be pro LGBT, tends to be, you know, I, I won't say pro left because I think a lot of them have, um, they are anti communist um, because groups like um, whatever they're called, the World Socialist website and the Socialist Equality Party of Canada, yeah. because those groups are having events that promote Russian disinformation or, or uh, where, where they're performing apologia for the Russian invasion. Um, a lot of folks in NAFO have come out as anti-communist um, just purely as a reaction. So yeah, it's a reactionary opinion. It's something we can talk about and we can address. Um, again, I'd be happy to talk to anyone from NAFO about communism and um, what what it really means to to support the working class internationally. And I think they'd be I think they'd be shocked, um, even the like ardently anti-communist ones. But you know, that's not really a conversation you can have when you're getting a one-sided lecture from a, a ideologues. And again, the discussion component was shut down way too early um, before I could ask any cogent questions um, because the room just fell into chaos. People started to get up and leave uh, because it was no longer a comfortable or safe space. Um, not that it was comfortable or safe uh, for most of the attendees to begin with. Um, they were there because they were concerned. And I do want to like say that this is very, very different from um, Israelis showing up to Palestinian events. Very, very different. Um, the, the power imbalance is fundamentally different. Um, you know, I, I went to a lot of uh, pro-Palestine events. I got fired from a journalism job for saying that Israel shouldn't kill journalists. Like, I'm on the record on that issue, which is part of why I'm not over there as a <laughs> reporter, um, you know, helping to tell the story. But I, I mow lawns for a living. Um, you know, there are... There are some things you can't say in media, and I said the things that you can't say, and that's fine. I, I've eaten that. All of the pro-Palestine events I went to were picketed. Um, they were picketed inside and outside with different interruptions from Israelis who, very similar to the Ukrainians, wrapped themselves in the national flag, um, intervened in the event aggressively. The scale 
of the conflicts is dramatically different. Um, you know, tens of thousands of Ukrainians have died. The Ukrainians have every right to express their outrage, no matter where in the world they live. They have every right to express their outrage. Um, they are not occupying or subjugating anybody. Um, they are fighting to retain control over their sovereign territory, facing an invasion by a country which is, you know, was considered to be a near peer power to the United States. Like um, a world leading military has invaded a small country. Um, and, and as a leftist, I think it's a pretty easy rule of thumb to say. Um, we always support the small against the big. You know, that's something that should hold true in almost every case, um, except in cases where there's clearly like a deliberate manipulation, um, like the case with the um, Ulster Unionists. Um, you wouldn't support the Ulster Unionists against Ireland um, because the Ulster Unionists aren't really truly the small against the big, that they are an extension of a bigger of Great Britain. Um, and so when we talk about like I Irish unification um as a left-wing ideal we're able to correctly identify um the cause of ireland as a small country um versus the cause of great britain um or or england um as a bigger country as an end as an imperial power imperialist power um you know we can we can correctly reconcile that and i think that a lot of people aren't able to do that with like the um donbass separatism crimea russia stuff um and it part of it comes down to geography part of it comes down to history part of it comes down to news reading and where people are getting the propaganda from and a lot of people on the left are getting their propaganda from bad sources now it's not even a predominant like it's not it's not a prevailing opinion on the left i'd say the vast majority of leftists i talk to interact with understand that Russia shouldn't be invading Ukraine. And that's sort of where it stops for them. I don't think they're in the like a Slava Ukraini kind of like they're not embracing the jingoistic nationalist militarism of uh the Ukrainian resistance. Neither am I. Like, look, today's event was shameful. It was a really bad look for the Toronto Library. I think the most frustrating moment for me was Right after the speaker finishes, uh, not the speaker, uh, rather, right after the library staff finished telling us that we weren't allowed to film without permission, prior written consent from the library were her specific words, um, a member of the World Socialist website, Entourage, stands up and begins to film the room because people are shouting. And he's like, oh, I'm, I'm going to get this all in, I'm going to get this all in video and put it all on the internet. And like, yeah, she called him on it. But they had just made a Ukrainian woman leave for filming. And by all, by all rights, he should have been out the door as well because now the, like she'd read the room, the riot act at that point. She'd established the ground rules and he immediately violated those rules. And to which the speaker, this Keith Jones guy, he says, oh, well, we, we're, we need to collect evidence um, in case there need to be criminal prosecutions. Whoa, brother, whoa. Like a bunch of fucking commies called the cops, called the fucking pigs into a supposedly left-wing event to protect it from a concerned ethnic minority group worried that their voices weren't being heard and like that is sick guys that is sick keith jones in my books he is kind of a richard spencer type character he's somebody who needs to be held accountable for this ridiculous mockery of left-wing politics yeah i'm pretty i'm pretty fired up about that shit as you can see um it was not it was not a it was not a good day um but it was really heartening to see all the young ukrainians uh come out and voice their uh, opposition to this thing um and i have a sneaking suspicion that there's going to be more i have a sneaking suspicion that in the near term future we're going to see more of these events um it's you know uh a way especially in partnership with the library and I've, I've i've been pretty adamant that i can see the community safety zone extending to like um russian community events and um i'm i'm very i'm very concerned um that there will be more pro russia organizing in canada um and that our politicians you know we're a, we are a free country we're a country um and we also have a history of like um enemy alien internments and like you know, no one wants to go down that road i don't want to see russians scooped up the streets and put in camps like that would be absurd um but 
this is the kind of seditious activity that undermines the presence of, of an entire community here. Um, because like there definitely were Russians in the room. There were people who were there because they love Vladimir Putin. Um, they heard about the controversy and decided to show up. It wasn't you know just trots. And I think that that bears mentioning too. I don't I don't know who those folks were, um, but but we'll try to identify them. And like, look, I guess this is my final point. Like, if you're a leftist whose politics on Ukraine are not yet known, um, but you think you know where you stand and where you stand is on the right side of history, um, especially if you're like an, an anarchist. Um, Maybe now's the time to do a little bit of entryism. Maybe now's the time to like get involved in these groups, figure out who's running them and take them apart from the inside. Um, we can disrupt them as leftists. You know, I can't because they know my opinions. I'm very public about my opinions and I'm speaking to you folks um, in the hopes that maybe some of you will decide to do the right thing. Um, will decide to help us identify and uh, disrupt as much of the pro-Russia organizing, um, or even just like let's let's, is I think the organizers would quibble that they're they're not pro they're they're pro-Russian working class or what you know whatever mealy mouth excuse they have to to weasel around the fact that they're offering apology for a genocidal conflict, um, and in fact deny genocide denied denied genocide in the in the course of the lecture, um, styling it as a, a plot to build a, a political consensus in order to like prevent anti-war opinions from flourishing or, you know, whatever, whatever conspiracy theory they have, like, dude, you drag hundreds of civilians from their homes and kill them in the streets. It's genocide. And then it happened. It happened in numerous Ukrainian cities very early in the war. Um, you're taking children off the streets. Again, like I say this as the descendant of um, an Irish home child, Boy, there's a there's a thing the Canadian government never reckoned with. Um, we can reckon with internment camps and, and, um, and our suppression of indigenous peoples and, and, and the residential school system. Uh, but the home child program, that'll be another 20 years, 30 years before they come around to recognizing that uh, created certain, you know, not the same, certainly not the same or even as bad, but um, they were scooping Irish kids, poor Irish kids off the street of an occupied country. You know, my great grandmother in the 1920s uh, got scooped off the street right around the time of the Irish Civil War, just shortly after the rising uh, streets of Galway, I think. Um, and she was put on a put on a boat and brought to Nova Scotia, um, where she lived with um, wealthy English family um, who, who treated her as domestic labor. And ultimately, like she became a member of the family through service, uh, which is like sounds like slavery with extra steps. But like I know it's not chattel slavery. Like I'm not I'm not one of those. But I'm just saying like I see the Russian nonprofits and, and charitable organizations scooping Ukrainian kids off streets in Ukraine and bringing them to God knows where in fucking Russia for Russian families to adopt and to have. Um, that is a form of genocide, guys. That is a form of genocide. And it's a bad look for the journal library to be platforming people um, who think otherwise. I'll say that. Um, and I think that the library probably should no longer be considered to be an active ally in social justice struggles. I mean, they did platform Nazis, um, and today they were platforming what, what I would call fascists. Um, but yeah, if you're if you're on the left, um, get out there, identify these folks, expose them however you can, inside, outside, um, bop them, and then no, we can't say that. So uh, that's all for me for now. This is Postmodern Cowboy. Thanks so much for watching. Keep it peaceful out there.